opportunity in a few months that we have to leave Lagos, like my dear German colleague here. Yeah. But don't worry, we'll miss Lagos a lot because this is a fabulous place. Such a fabulous place that you can have events like this one today. And uh, Oliver, you, you know that. Um, I'm really admiring this kind of work you do from the very beginning that we have this political politics. I said to my new colleague here, Manon, that uh, don't worry, with a point of view, uh, the Benin Mundo Foundation is very top, top quality. You have the creme de la creme of the art market, the creme de la creme of business uh, linked with art. So it's exactly what, uh, what Lagos is in one sense. So I won't be long. I'm so, so happy that we are back. Even in the COVID, uh, less people, because we have a reason. So happy that we are back. Thank you. My voice is enough in one sense. Um, I'm sure that everything will be fabulously well technically, I'm sure, you see. And uh, once more, uh, I think it's very high quality. We are very happy, very proud to have you enjoy this session. Uh, I don't know, I give the floor to my dear Oliver. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much. Merci beaucoup, Charles. That's the only French I know, so... I'm not going to start pretending, but I'm going to flaunt it. Okay. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the sixth edition of Point of View, organized by the Benewon Foundation in collaboration with Alliance Francaise, the Society of Nigerian Artists, and CCA Lagos. We are particularly happy to be back with Point of View after such a long while, due to the outbreak of COVID and the need to keep our audience safe. Some of you may have lost family, close friends, associates to this in this difficult period, but our prayers and well wishes are with you, and we say keep strong and stay safe. Today, we will be speaking about new digital pathways, technology, creating, and marketing art. And we have the privilege of having seven distinguished and ex experienced speakers to do enough justice to it. I'll just uh, give a broad overview of the theme, and then thereafter, we we'll delve into it. New digital pathways, technology, creating a marketing art. This edition, the sixth edition of Point of View, will provide a deeper understanding of how technological advancements like the internet, social media, virtual and augmented reality, blockchain, and cryptocurrencies have not only given rise to new forms of art, including non-fungible tokens, NFTs, but have also disrupted the global art market. In charting sustainable growth and predicting the future of the sector in Africa, the talks will explore how institutions, art professionals, and investors alike can embrace these new developments while exploring the legal implications of collecting. And so without um, further ado, I'll ask uh, one of our partners, uh, Oinda Fakaye, to also give a few remarks. Oinda, please. Good evening, everyone. Um, I'd like to, first of all, start by thanking Oliver and Wombu for inviting us to all be here and such a topical discussion. Uh, and a big thank you to the Ben and Wombu Foundation, the Society for Visual Arts, um, Alliance Francaise, and of course, the Micah Denuga Center where we find ourselves. Now, I started my curatorial career in 2008 at the Center for Contemporary Arts, Lagos and have very recently become the director there. Since its inception, our focus has been on works in the new media and experimental art space, um, focusing on photography, animation, film, video, performance, and installation. My very first exhibition was in video arts in 2009. Um, and I remember at the time, people you know, would approach me and say, why video arts? I mean, how can the artists make money from video? It's too difficult to collect. I mean, I went on to found the Video Art Network Lagos that year with um, 
Judah Nogwi and um, video and sound artist Emeka Ogbo, who both have thriving careers within the medium. Um, and over the years, we have focused on not just video, but expanded to include augmented reality, project mapping, and virtual reality. Upon my um, appointment at CCA and my return 12 years later, um, I find myself exploring NFTs and crypto art. Uh, and I've been fortunate enough to work with one of our speakers, um, Osinachi, to run workshops for artists so that they are versed in how to make, um, sustain, and market uh, their NFT-based products. What amazes me is that less than five years ago, I sat on a panel at the very first ArtX, um, trying to convince the audience that collectors needed to build into their collection video, sound, um, photography, um, as you know, most of the collectors, and I guess even now, you know, were still focused on painting and still focused on traditional sculptures. I'm interested to see if today the argument still stands, and if the recent flurry of art sales by um, Sotheby's, we saw Beeple in $600 million, you know, dollars in eth in eth through Ethereum, you know, being spent on works of crypto art. Um, it will be interesting to see if the arguments here presented today um, can come alongside things like the new um, comprehensive guide to art NFTs by Christie's. Um, so what we're talking about is something that the art world is really grappling with. And it's not just a local issue, it's a global issue. Uh, and I'm excited that we are coming alongside as, as the global art community are um, to interrogate the, the new nuances, I think, of new media, of digital art. Um, and I'm excited to hear as, about NFTs in terms of sustainability, especially as when internet-based arts first came on the scene, it was really about the ephemeral. And now, when we talk about collecting, it really is about having a lasting um, uh, effect. So with that, and without further ado, I'm going to pass on um, the mic so that we can kick off this evening. And thank you again for having us. Center for Contemporary Arts, um, and me, uh, Oliver, I'll hand the mic over to you. Well, thank you very much, Oyinda. Uh, we'll just take a short video that um, will talk about the foundation, the beginnings of point of view, what we're trying to achieve, and it will talk about uh, even previous editions we've done, just to give you an overview. So a very short video now, and then thereafter, we go straight into presentations and the panel discussion. Thank you. The Benin Wawa Foundation is a non-profit organization that aims to promote and preserve the legacy of celebrated Nigerian artist, scholar, educator, administrator, and statesman, Benin Wawa, while increasing the global appreciation of the visual arts in Africa and our related diaspora. Hinge on advocacy, scholarship, and intellectual engagement, the Foundation's three-pronged approach involves promoting, fostering, explaining, protecting, and giving prestige to Nwawa's artistic, intellectual, and political legacy, maintaining a diverse, multidisciplinary public program of exhibitions, projects, workshops, talks, and lectures, and promoting cross-cultural ties and exchange between established and emerging artists, designers, and curators through international residences. Ongoing initiatives include the Benin Wong Distinguished Lectures and Point of View, a monthly series of talks initiated in collaboration with the Society of Nigerian Artists and supported by Alliance Francais Stroke Macademiga Centre Lagos. Point of View interrogates the evolving role of the visual arts in addressing pressing issues affecting Africa and the rest of the world. The talks draw from other creative disciplines and such diverse sectors as government, science and technology to impact policy by raising awareness advocating for change and inspiring action. It aims to further encourage support and funding for the visual artists through public and private sector partnership while ensuring continued artist professional development and empowerment. On September 17, 
2019, the first edition theme, A Case for the Artist Resale Act, advocated for visual artists benefiting from secondary and downstream sales of their works by seeking to establish an effective system for collecting resale royalties and remunerating artists. SNA can come up tonight with a draft of what they want in activating Section 13. I promise you by Monday next week, I will take the draft and get the ministerial approval of the regulation. On October 15, 2019, the second edition theme, Raising Capital Against High Value Works of Art, sought to encourage the growing recognition of Nigerian art as a new alternative asset class while providing a deeper understanding of art as collateral for learning transactions such as financing business expansions and investments for high-end purchases. It also aimed to support the development of art investment products as well as the diversification of investment portfolios with the integration of art. Um, the regulatory framework is um, yet to pick. All the presentations that you might hear and all the talks that we're giving really uh, do not carry much weight if there's no trust. On November 22, 2019, the third edition themed Museums, Tourism and Urban Development addressed key issues, trends and challenges in Nigeria's cultural tourism sector. Leading architects share their insights on the most innovative construction and design trends using completed, ongoing and upcoming projects as examples. Museum specialists also shed light on improving visitor experiences, preservation and conservation activities, as well as on the challenges they face, while government authorities highlighted investment opportunities and spoke on museum development and destination marketing. To begin to start the process of remedying the thefts of the 700 works. And the image on the right is from one of his descendants, Ni Ifake, and I took that picture because he works at the National Museum. On January 24, 2020, the fourth edition themed Art as a Driver for Environmental Sustainability advocated for sustainable cities and communities by promoting interdisciplinary collaborations between professionals across such diverse sectors as government, the arts, science and technology. Specifically, it highlighted the significant role of the visual arts in ensuring policy frameworks that address climate change. We are endowed with about 1.2 billion people, 43% of which are below the age of 15. Is that not staggering? In February 26, 2020, the fifth edition themed Funding for the Visual Arts Public and Private Sector Partnership examined recent developments in public and private sector funding support for the creative arts in Nigeria, with a special focus on the Creative Industry Financing Initiative introduced by the Central Bank of Nigeria in collaboration with the Bankers' Committee. I do finally get to paint and I want to sell. Obviously, I'm not selling to a gallery because I'm not going to wait or go through that whole process. Either I put it on Instagram or I go and find someone who I can sell to directly because I need to pay the bills. You need to treat art as a business, right? I know there's a part for place for CSR, but you need to treat it as a business, profit and loss. There has to be a strong case, not just from a business point of view, but also from a CSR point of view. When I say uh, let's consider art as a business, I'm probably saying for Jibril, we're not saying as a real um, commercial business, but as an as an as initiative that is not just about dashing somebody money so they can express themselves. Good product more readily lends itself to financing. So I think artists should go back and focus on quality of what is being produced. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed that. That gives you a brief overview of point of view. So welcome to the sixth edition. And uh, to kick it off is uh, the first speaker, Insikak John. I'll do a little introduction now about him. I'll try to sum up his uh, career in a few words. And I've done that because uh, we can be here all day if, if, I, if I let go. Insikak John is the head of Enterprise Innovation Hub at the Nigerian Stock Exchange, NSC. 
He served a similar role at East Wind Technologies Limited from 2016 to 2018, where he worked as the head of technology and strategy. He was also the chief operating officer at Procentric IQ Limited and the key accounts manager at Capstone Solutions Limited, where he also served as the enterprise solutions manager. After studying computer science at the University of Uyo Akwaibom, he attended the discipline entrepreneurship at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, MIT, in 2016. In 2017 and 2020, he completed courses in fintech and innovation at the University of Hong Kong and in digital transformation platform strategies at MIT, respectively. So without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Insikat John to the stage to deliver his presentation. A round of applause for him, please. Good evening, everyone. I hope I'm audible. I can hardly hear myself. All right, so um, my name is Nsikak John, and um, I'm not the head of innovation in the Nigerian Stock Exchange. Like you would be aware, there's no organization called the Nigerian Stock Exchange as at this moment. We just completed our restructuring. So what you have is the Nigerian Exchange Group, and of course you have three subsidiaries. One of them is um, the Nigerian, the NGX Limited, where I work as head of solutions and innovation. And then you also have the NGX Regulation, another company, and then of course you have the NGX Real Estate. So I'm the head of solutions and innovation in the NGX Limited. And the fact that we've demutualized means that um, it's a lot of opportunity to build value for our partners and stakeholders. It's actually a very exciting, um, exciting season for us. So thank you, Oliver and team, for putting this together, and all the partners. Um, let me assume that I'll, I'll be allowed to stand on existing protocol. All right, so just testing this. Um, OK, OK, great. So I just have about 20 minutes. Um, to talk to you about advancements in financial technology, tokenization, and fractional ownership of art. I'll spend the first um, five minutes talking about technology, and then I'll spend about 10 minutes trying to you know, talk about the convergence of technology in arts to create value you know, within the arts ecosystem. And then, of course, leave some time for maybe questions or comments. Um, first of all, um, let's start from the printing press, okay? I think this is working now. Let's start from the printing press, um, the Gutenberg moment, all right? I mean, before, before the printing press, um, knowledge was the exclusive reserve, preserve of some people. You had to travel long distances to consult them for knowledge. You know, people like um, Aristotle, Confucius, and the likes. And then with the printing press, um, books were printed, and um, anybody who could read a book could have access to knowledge. And so, you know, knowledge was democratized. And you have to stay with those gifted people, you know, as it were. And so today, we see a situation where we have, you know, over about 15 Gutenberg moments happening at the same time across all these technology stacks, you know, artificial intelligence, blockchain democratizing access to trust, you know, solar energy democratizing access to energy, um, self-driven cars, access to transportation and mobility. And all of these are happening at the same time. And it's creating massive opportunity, you know, for businesses and individuals to, you know, also grow exponentially. And we also see that in the last 150 years or more, there's been pandemics, there have been wars, there have been economic meltdowns, and all sorts of things. But the growth part of technology has been exponential and upwards. And any business or individual that is able to tap in or intercept that growth path for his business also begins to be exponentially successful. You know, so. Technology also creates abundance, right? A convergence of technology creates abundance. 
And in, in the days to come, it is only the people who understand how to tap into abundance that will be successful. The old paradigms are built around scarcity. You know, uh, if you look at capitalism, I'll call it the commercialization of scarcity. Anything you could make scarce, you know, becomes expensive, if I can use that word. You know, but going forward, it is the companies and people and organizations and countries that understand how to leverage the abundance created by the technology advancements, these technology advancements that will also become exponentially successful. What do I mean? Look at Google, for instance. You know, they leverage the abundance of information in the world and they said, we want to organize the world's information. And they've created massive value for themselves. Um, a, B, and B, they never told people to build living spaces. They didn't even contribute to it, but they just leveraged an abundance of spare living spaces all over the world and they've become exponentially successful. Uber, the same thing with cars and drivers. Locally, pay stock you know, that just became a unicorn, leverage an abundance of small companies in Nigeria who are trying to commercialize online. And they've become, you know, bigger than these three legacy banks put together in five years. You know, some of these banks are over 70 years old, for instance. All right. And I could continue. I mean, Bet Niger. Bet Niger today, if you look at internet traffic from Nigeria, after Google, it's Bet Niger before Facebook and they're leveraging an abundance of young people that want to get rich quickly through sports betting. And they've created stupendous value for themselves. So, I, 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 I guess you get my drift. So how can we leverage the abundance mindset in arts? This is a difficult question. You know, because there's a connection between, you know, scarcity, you know, a limitation in availability of the work and the value in the market. Uh, while I was, you know, talking with some art experts like Ben and some other, Oliver and some other people, they told me that, for instance, if an artist dies, you know, it is a tendency that his works in the market become expensive because there's a truncation of the supply of the work. So, you know, for, for a field like arts, how do we leverage and deploy the abundance mindset, knowing that for it to be valuable in arts, it's got to be scarce, necessarily. So that's the question that, one of the questions I, I, I hope I will have some answers to this evening. But the way we try to answer this question is this. You know, in the Nigerian Stock Exchange then, Nigerian Exchange Limited now, uh, we, are, we have a lot of artworks. You know, we are very big on arts. We have a lot of arts events. And um, we began to look at the ecosystem. And we realized that it's like a niche ecosystem, right? So we have the supply side, of course, the producers, the artists. You have the channels, galleries, exhibitors, other value-added services within the industry. And then you have the demand side, you know, high net worth individuals, collectors, and then value is created within that ecosystem. Meanwhile, we know that in our country, we have an abundance of young people and a lot of investors. And sometimes they are just looking for you know, instruments, you know, smart asset classes to participate in. So we ask ourselves the question, why can't we open up the arts ecosystem by democratizing access to the works, such that instead of having one person buy the work for maybe five, 10, 50 million Naira, we tokenize the works into a different, you know, fractional units and tokens, so that a lot more people can it will become part owners. So we democratize ownership and then open up the space for participation for, for people who sometimes are not interested in arts. They just want to invest in a smart asset class. So we, we did this and we built you know, the art exchange. So the way it works is, let's assume that an artist has you know, a work that he wants to sell, maybe 50 million naira, for instance. Um, he goes to one of our licensed galleries, and then the work is inspected, you know, there's valuation, and then of course validation of the source and the, the cost. And if there's an agreement, he agrees to issue the work on our platform, you know, to list the work. On listing, the work can be tokenized into, say, 1,000 tokens. 
All right, and each token can be 50,000 Naira, for instance. And then uh, there's a primary offer period where investors can buy into the work. You can buy 5, 10, 15 tokens. The issuer, the owner can list 100% of the tokens, or you can just list 80% and keep 20%. So at the end of the primary offer, all the token holders become the, you know, collective owners of the work. The fiscal work goes to a custodian. All right, the custodian creates commercial value for the work, takes it for exhibitions, and then of course you can even sell, you know, if the price is good and come and reward all the token holders. So the, the token holders become the owners of the work and um, when the work makes money, they get dividends and they can even trade it at the secondary market for people that want to come in later who couldn't get the token at the primary offering. And so we have the token subscription platform for primary and secondary markets. And we felt that by doing this, we can create, you know, democratized ownership of artworks to, to build communities, connections, and shared prosperity. And um, when we, this is on, this is live, you know, but of course we are doing a pilot. We are a well-regulated company and um, we are talking to the regulator to let us do this with all of what's happening around crypto assets in the country. We want to avoid crypto want to go from fiat tokens and back without touching crypto for now. So um, the art exchange creates value because we've created convergence around the works. Some people, it's just the work, right? Some people is the artists, so they, they build their interest around the artists. Some people is just the investment. This is a good asset class, you know, with good returns. And then for some people, they just like the fact that this is happening on the blockchain with the security, transparency, and traceability, of course, for the, for the works. So um, while we were doing this, as I begin to wrap up, the NFTs happened. And you know, it brought a lot of excitement into the space. You know, of course, we all know what has happened with NFTs. And we began to say, so how do we expand you know, the platform, the AdExchange platform? to also issue NFTs in Nigeria so that people like, you know, is it Sinachi? You know, when he's issuing the next NFT, he doesn't have to do it on an international platform. He can do it locally. So today we are working to expand the art exchange platform to also issue NFTs. And um, the way I look at NFTs, the way I look at NFTs is that it does two things. Number one, it, it solves the issue of you know, piracy and then fake copies of the work because you can only have one original copy, but you can have different copies and everybody knows these are not the originals. And anybody can do anything. A lot of people can build communities around the non-original work, but we know that just one person has the original copy. So in that case, it solves the problem of authenticity, you know, and, and piracy while also leveraging an abundance. So it's a combination of, of, of the two. So um, I would like to leave it here in case there are questions and of course we can interact some more and as we finish the pilot and launch our ad exchange, um, we hope that some of you will find it interesting enough to participate. Thank you. I'll, I'll hand it over to Oliver in case there are questions or comments. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. So do you have any questions for him, just very briefly, maybe we can take two quick questions before we go on to our next presentation. Hi, my name is Hannah. Thank you for the presentation. Um, you mentioned that in the process of tokenization, you begin with listed or certified galleries that you work with for verification of the artwork, several verifications, and then it goes to the further steps. And then you mentioned that part of it can also be owned by, is it the gallery or the artist in this case, or the collectors? So because you, know, you, you acquire your work from the certified galleries or agency, as I understand. Now my question is, who can own part of their own percentage? In this case, is it the agency or the artists themselves? Okay. 
I'll give you some of these. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so the person that can own part of the work is the issuer. All right, the issuer can be the artist or a gallery. All right, so on the platform, there are different user groups. One is the issuer, whoever is issuing the work. It can be the artist that comes to the platform directly to express an interest to issue, or it can be a gallery who has, for it to be a gallery, he has the rights, you know, he has the permission from the artist to issue the work. So either the gallery or the owner of the work can hold back you know, part of it. So he becomes a part owner of the work when it's issued. I hope that clarifies. Okay, any other question? Okay. Yeah, uh, Cesar Kiliro by name. Uh, I, need, I need to find out more details around the consultantship. Is it like you work with in insurance firms or you have a set of um, people that you qualify as um, custodians of artworks? Thank you, Cesar. Nice to see you. Same here, sir. <laughs> so, um, Today, we at the pilot level, we are working with one custodian, and these are licensed custodians in the market. All right, but there's an insurance component to the work, and um, you know, so there's insurance, all right, for the assets. You know, remember, some of these assets are very pricey, and of course, they are very dear. So, even though we vetted the custodians to make sure that the assets are safe, they still insurance as part of the service providers for the platform. Okay, I saw your hand. Okay, I saw somebody else's hand. Okay. Hi there. Um, Oops. <laughs> my name is Michael Ogu. Um, so I had a question about the platform. I, uh, some clarif clarifications, actually. Is it um, is it crypto based, blockchain based? Because I know you said something about it's, it's regulations. Is blockchain. And it has, of course, if it's blockchain, it has the capability for crypto. But because of our environment yeah. and the posture of SEC and the CBN on crypto, what we are doing is conversion from fiat to tokens. So we are not touching crypto. Okay, so so, so you come with fiat, okay. and then you, you fund your wallet with fiat, and then you buy tokens. And then what goes into your wallet is tokens. So it's more like centralized blockchain then, as opposed to yes. decentralized. So, so we have you have private the private blockchain, not okay. not public not and not decentralized. Yes. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much, Insakat John. I thought we were going to give him a heftier round of applause. So next up is um, a very dear friend of mine. Shewon Ali, and I'll do a very brief introduction again because uh, she's done quite a bit in the art space in Lagos. So I'll make it as brief as possible so we're not going to be here all night long. Shewon Ali is a lawyer and art consultant based in Lagos, Nigeria. She is the founder and director of June Creative Art Advisory, a multi-service art advisory firm that provides customized and specialist support for artists, collectors, and brands, including collection development, art acquisition, commissions, framing, transportation, and in installation. For over five years, Ali has worked with individuals, brands, and institutions to present creative projects such as exhibitions, private art events, theater and film productions, book presentations, art competitions, auctions, and trainings. As a consultant, she provides programming, research, fundraising, project management support, including communication strategies and administrative services for cultural institutions. Through the connoisseurship approach of her firm, she also educates investors about market trends and the investment value of African art. A round of applause for her as she comes up to the stage to deliver the second presentation. Okay, good evening everybody and um, thank you for joining us this evening. I hope it will be um, an enlightening session. Um, there's a lot to talk about um, in terms of analytics, blockchain technology, cryptocurrency and obviously um, predicting how all of this, you know, sort of plays out in the art market. So just very quickly, I will um, go in straight away and 
if you have any questions along the way, please feel free to stop me and just ask. Otherwise, um, it would be okay to do that after the presentation. Um, next slide, please. Okay. Okay, so we'd have some definitions. Um, I'll give a brief um, run through about the popular cryptocurrencies, um, how the art market is faring at the moment, and obviously how we expect or what we hope to see in the future. So analytics, um, let's start with analytics. Okay. So that's basically a process that um, the computer examines data that has been um, input into it um, using mathematical methods and you know the whole idea is to find some significant trends that can help you know artists um, art professionals and even investors make better decisions um, there's also another another definition which gives it as the information that results from the whole um, process of inputting information into um, the computer um, after that, just very quickly, I'll go to um, blockchain technology, just in case you do not know what that means. Um, the Harvard Business Review um, defines it as an open distributed ledger that um, can record transactions between two parties efficiently and in a very verifiable and permanent way. Next up is um, cryptocurrency. And I believe many people would have heard one or two things about cryptocurrency and how it's playing out in the art currently. Some other people refer it to as digital money and it's all internet based. Um, you know, it's a medium of exchange that uses cryptographical functions to conduct financial transactions. Um, again, cryptocurrencies are leveraging on the blockchain technology and as the speaker also mentioned earlier, you know, decentralization, transparency, and immutability are very key um, factors that come into play. So moving on very quickly, we have um, a few cryptocurrencies, Bitcoin being the biggest and the most popular and, you know, the most influential so far. Um, I've just done a you know, a birth year for all the cryptocurrencies. So Bitcoin started in um, 2008. We have Ethereum, which is the most actively used. And I believe um, most people that have started, you know, buying one or two works on the blockchain would recognize that um, Ether is the most popular is the most popular cryptocurrency that, that has been used, um, particularly because of the smart contracts that um, are also built in. We'll come to that a little bit later. Um, going by the current market trends and the current market, um, not the trends, sorry, ma market values. So one Ether at the moment is about 950,000 Naira. Um, Bitcoin Cash, which is just a spin-off of um, Bitcoin, um, that was, you know, set up to sort of uh, make transactions a little bit quicker um, as the Bitcoin um, networks and the nodes that, you know, were on the blockchain were a, lit were a little bit slower. So Bitcoin Cash started in um, 2017. Another derivation of Bitcoin Cash is Bitcoin SV. Um, Bitcoin Cash at the moment is about 300,000 Naira to one um, Bitcoin Cash. We also have Litecoin which is the sixth largest, um, that's about 90,000 Naira at the moment, um, started in 2011. Um, Tether, um, USDDT, that's particularly interesting at the moment because I think it's um, one to one. So, um, somebody correct me if I'm wrong, please, but I think um, what, what, what they have done with um, Tether is to match um, fiat money, in this case, US dollars, so it's one to one at the moment. Um, there's been a couple more hundreds, hundred, hundred cryptocurrencies that have surfaced over time, but um, I think these are one of the most popular ones at the moment. I mean, people are using so many others and so many others are coming up 
on the blockchain as well. So very quickly, this is a typical transaction cycle that you'd find on the blockchain. So, you know, um, Bitcoin, someone is requesting, you know, a transaction and then, you know, the you request a transaction and it's broadcast, you know, between a peer to peer. I'm sure some people again would know the current um, SEC rules and CBN regulations um, attached to cryptocurrency at the moment. So um, you, you cannot um, use fiat money to buy um, cryptocurrencies. So what you generally have is people, you know, sort of requesting, oh, I have Ether to change into um, USD. Does anybody want some Ether? You know, you do the exchange over a secured network, um, network of nodes, as I mentioned earlier. And then as long as it's verified and you've been able to meet the requirements, your transaction goes through and it's basically complete. So if anybody's interested in, you know, just sort of getting more information about this very straightforward um, diagram, you can just, you know, look up Block Geeks on Google. So some more um, crypto terms that I think are also very important for um, today's discussion. We have confirmation, we have mining, um, there's hashing, smart contracts, um, what a block actually means, and then you have the fork, your gas fees and stats. Um, I'm just gonna go through them again very quickly so we have uh, more time to um, to discuss at the end, um, but maybe, okay. Well, f I'll just quickly explain mining. So mining, again, you know, it's a process of finding new Bitcoins. Um, it involves compiling recent transactions into blocks, trying to solve a compu compu computationally <laughs> difficult puzzle by hashing. And then hashing is also explained. Gas um, is when, you know, is used to send Ethereum um, across the network and it's a small amount of Ethereum that's necessary for your transaction to go through. Um, fork, I think I've touched on a little bit earlier. That's basically when a digital asset is split into two different cryptocurrencies. So as you had before, Bitcoin, and then you now have um, Bitcoin um, Cash. So how does all of this, you know, affect the art market? Some of you may recognize um, um, this work. It's basically the every days, the first 5,000 days by Mike Winkleman, who is otherwise known as Beeple. Um, this was the work that went for, I think it was $60 million. And um, with the premium that was added on by um, Christie's, that's what took it up to about $69,000, $69 million, sorry. So moving on, um, we'll just go through some of the pros and cons of um, analytics. Um, data is very, in is you know, an integral analytic tool. Um, again, you know, talking about transparency, you're able to make informed um, purchases. Um, we're starting to see a parallel growth with um, other financial markets. Um, you know, people are starting to digitize sales prices. So you're having auctions, auction houses, and gallerists and you know other dealers starting to um starting to um you know let us know what they've sold works for and you know what the values of these works are going for at the moment um that also is helping to build trust with new players that are looking to invest and come into the market um we're able to now analyze um risk and spot some trends that are you know popping up and um that's also very helpful for machine learning and artificial intelligence to again, you know, sort of set the trends and see what's popular and what really isn't um, a good work to maybe sometimes invest in. Um, some of the cons for, um, you know, using analytics in the art market. Art is subjective and qualitative, so you can't really um, find many artworks that, that look the same. And then um, there's the longevity of a medium. Of course, you know, we are at, this, at a stage where 
analytics can't really tell you how long you know a medium can perhaps last for or how that's going to fare in maybe another 10 years. There's also patchy data, especially for new artists. Um, some people are not, um, will I say, necessarily <laughs> popular on Google. So if you're looking to, you know, you know, hedge your investments based on what you find online, um, that can also be a problem. It's still very early days, um, you know, things like fraud is still a bit difficult to um, detect in some cases. But we'll talk about fraud in a little bit, because um, that's also another thing that has surfaced recently. OK, um, blockchain technology is obviously raising a lot of issues, which brings us to NFTs, non-fungible tokens, the digital assets that run on the blockchain. And unlike other cryptocurrencies, um, they're not fungible, like I said before. The works are the works are not replaceable by um, another identical item, so one work is not exactly the same as another. Um, NFTs allow you to buy and sell ownership of unique digital items, and you can um, keep track of ownership. So at any point, you know who owns um, who owns what on the blockchain. So we're talking about drawings, um, animated GIFs, songs, items in video games, which is where a lot of um, these um, things sort of like stem from. And an NFT can either be one of a kind again, and um, they can also be copies of um, one work. But like I said before, the blockchain will keep track of ownership of every work. A uh, majority of the NFTs that are built are are you know, using Ethereum. Artists are heavily adopting NFTs at the moment, which is um, good and bad. And um, of course, artists are selling their works in a verif verifiable digital form directly to their clients globally as well, you know, without needing the help of intermediaries like um, dealers, art galleries, and um, auction houses. Okay, so next. So some case studies. Um, I've mentioned Every Days by um, Beeple earlier on. Um, $69 million was, um, again, you know, what it eventually, the total that it sold for. Um, when, you know, it was um, sold through Christie's and what happened was, um, I think the bid started at $100. $100 um, the bid started off at. Basically, what this work is, is um, in 20, 2007, you have uh, Mike Winkleman, who started producing works every day. So in May 2007, dig digital artists created and posted new work every day online. And um, that went up, up, up until 7th of January 2021. Um, like I said, the, the work sold for 60 about $60 million, and um, what shot it up was the buyer's premium. Um, but it's also very interesting to note that Christie's wasn't paid in cryptocurrency. Christie's um, took their money, um, they, they, they took their money um, in fiat, so real money. $9 million was what they um, realized from that sale. And, um, you know, that was, um, I think it's the third, third largest sale in auction so far. Um, I think there's only two other works that were, uh, have been more expensive than um, every day's. So moving forward and more um, locally and perhaps um, more familiar to some of us, um, there's Jacon Osinachi who um, was able to sell a resignation for 20 Ether, which worked out to be about $35,000. Um, Austin actually is doing great work. I think he's also here on the panel, so it might be better for him to um, discuss his um, art practice and how he's managed to um, command such prices over the years. Um, this very recently came up. Um, it's by Emily Rajo Ratajowski. Um, she's a model and an actress. And what she has basically tried to do here is to um,
back um, control of how her images, you know, have been circulating. So she's also selling crypto. Um, she's also selling crypto. This is actually the work. So it has her posing in front of another work that was done by another digital artist of an Instagram post that she had up um, before that. So the work is called um, Buy Myself Back, a model for redistribution. And um, they haven't actually sold that work yet, as far as I know. I think Christie is also selling the work. Um, if anybody knows any other information about it, I'll be eager to hear that. Um, so again, you know, she's doing the NFT. She's um, featuring, like I said, a photograph of herself in front of, of another print by another artist that contains a photo of herself that was taken by presumably another artist. So again, I think for some of us, we can start to see how um, a lot of complications might start to um, surface based on um, copyright fraud and, you know, just who's, who owns what, basically. Okay, so just some um, legal implications very quickly. Um, as we start to see NFTs grow, we definitely would have more intellectual property disputes to um, sort out. Um, there's copyright fraud, and I think some people may have heard about um, Ayon Fair and um, Chidima Noli, who are two female Nigerian artists who um, had people impersonate their works. So their works were actually minted and put on, um, I think it was Nifty Gateway or Open Seas, one of the marketplaces where you can sell um, NFTs without their knowledge, of course. So they weren't aware and, you know, that's, that's what made it so um, interesting for a lot of people. Again, in terms of ownership, um, as buyers, you do not own the NFT. So what you basically own is a license to use and um, not a license to transfer the copyright, especially as you know the creators usually still obtain some royalty fees after every sale. Um, again, you know we're starting to look at classification for regulatory and tax purposes. Um, NFTs are can potentially have significant value and they're likely to become um, um, assets, you know, that um, people would want to pass on to um, loved ones, family members or whatever. So we're starting to ask now, you know, how are they stored and how will they be transferred? You know, would you put your link in your will? You know, you know how, how would you transfer such um, assets? And, um, you know, some people are obviously still very wary about NFTs and, you know, they're particularly concerned because of the speculative nature. You know, how are we determine, how are we able to determine value? And um, it's still very difficult because we, we don't have that, like say, peg or guide to say, okay, this, this work can go for this price definitely, as opposed to somebody just liking it and paying any amount for the work. Um, I won't labor too much on that. In Nigeria, we know that um, peer-to-peer is what is currently um, happening at the moment. So, some benefits for um, NFTs and having them on the, and you know, buying works off of the blockchain. We're able to democratize um, fine art investment. So, I'll give an example of, um, you know, just how galleries might, work you know in um you know proper brick and mortar situations you know you go in a gallery you if you're not really known you're most likely not going to get some sale go through um if i wanted to buy a grillo for example use of grillo painting i think um, i might have to do some work in terms of um, my bank balance and you know knowing the right sort of people but of course um on the blockchain you're able to bypass some of those things. And um, of course, I've spoken a bit about proof of ownership, um, improving provenance and reducing art forgery. Um, you know, one person has the link and that's it. And it's also helping to create a more ethical way of paying artists, um, especially with the royalties that, you know, come up after every 
after every time the work is sold. Um, it can also be a great um, base for a catalogue raisonné. Um, I know many artists are, you know, sort of looking to see where their works are, and um, that can be a very good way to, you know, have a have a good um, overlook of what you have. Okay, um, so predictions for the art market, like I said, things are still very speculative and uncertain, um, but I think it would be good to keep some of the following in mind. Um, the, the market is developing clearly, and um, you know, it's operating in a way that we're seeing new stakeholders, so new artists, um, new art professionals, and um, a, ge a new generation of collectors, which is very exciting. Um, there are less barriers, obviously, um, you know, breaking down barriers to entry, um, you know, maybe not in this climate, but um, abroad, you know, having black artists, um, you know, go over some um, hurdles to get the works shown. Um, digitization is obviously helping with transparency, efficiency, and an accessible market. Um, there's a gradual recovery generally. So what we're starting to ask as well that, you know, even after the NFT boom, what happens to businesses? You know, how are they going to safely return to um, pre-pandemic times and, you know, even thrive in these um, times? So of course, we're still, you know, th this doesn't change. We're still going to be looking out for um, quality over quantity. Um, are your works imbibing quality, depth, and innovation. Of course, you have to be um, showing and selling things that are value for money. Um, digital tools and channels. Of course, we are starting to see people um, present innovative works um, through innovative ways, and um, that's easing the online offerings and you know just giving a general um, wide wider market. So again, data is very key. Uh, we need data to transform the art world. We can't run away from that. Um, but again, like I say to most people, it's just one element and, you know, yes, it's available to produce art, appreciate art and invest in art, but we, we should also look at other, um, other qualities. So yeah, I think I'll um, leave it there for now. Um, if anybody has any questions, please feel free to um, contact me and then we can talk a bit more. Thank you. Okay, another round of applause for Sean, the previous speaker. I think it was very enlightening. enlightening. Uh, let's take a few questions from the audience, just two questions and then we'll move on to the panel discussion. Any questions, please? Bonjour tout le monde, good evening everybody. Julius Yoji is my name, I'm the CEO every year at Gallery and Cultural Nexus. I just want you to share some light in terms of your discussion on and the roles of, um, we, we're talking about, uh, uh, let's look at uh, AI, intellig uh, using AI for art, uh, photography, and the digital art which is created now. So uh, I want you to, do you have any overview in terms of the relationship business-wise, on those three together. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for that question. Um, I mean, you know, it, we're, still, we're still in new terrain, and even those tools that you've mentioned are quite expensive to, you know, to acquire and, um, you know, bring into the art market. I'm not a very tech person. I don't know how AI is going to transform the industry. I'm very hopeful. I've seen some things that have happened. Um, people are still obviously testing. I think um, it might be Sotheby's, I'm not sure. They have a facial recognition app thing going that, you know, to detect um, fake works, so to speak. So I think, you know, it's, it's still not very um, popular, but I think we'll get there eventually, but, you know, slowly but surely. But I, I, but I do not know about any grave 
you know, progress that has been made in terms of um, AI and um, other technologies. Okay, thank you. Uh, is there a second question, please? Okay, Charles. Merci. Um, what you said is amazing. Honestly, I, I, I learned a lot of things. Thank you very much that I didn't know. I'm an art lover. I'm a collector. You're welcome. Um, you said, let's talk about art. Is it really art? Is it, is it really art that I feel that I, I look in my lounge, that I touch? Or is it a way to invest? a way to enter in a business with a kind of excuse, which is called art. I didn't get the last, is it kind of a... Is it really art yes. or is it a kind of uh, excuse, a kind of, um, how do you call that in English, a kind of um, a way mm -hmm. to enter business, but you pretend it's art. You, 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 you see what I mean? Kind of fake, fake... Uh, Exactly. Thank Fair you for point. helping me. Yeah. Can we speak? Can we? Is it really art any longer, or is it just a way? Yes. It's just a way to invest to make business. No, no, no. And of the course. excuse is saying that we 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 are not. No, it's, de it's definitely still art. Um, I mean, what you're producing is a work of art. You know, most times it's original. It's being created by an artist. Um, what then happens after? it has been produced, you know. Some people would are gifted works of art. They don't buy, per se. You know, so they have all these fantastic things in their offices and their homes, which they haven't, you know, parted real value for. But um, I, I get what you mean. Like, when we, when we start talking about com commercialization of art, are we then really discussing art or, you know, talking about how much money we can get? But, you know, it's a commodity like any other market. Yes, we, we, we also have to see that way sometimes as a commodity, yes. <laughs> Sorry, if I may, just a rider to, you know, what you said. Um, and, and it's a very important question because while we're um, thinking about the art exchange, we use the word tokenization for the works. And of course, because we are not arts people, we are, we are investment people, we began to look around the arts expertise and sample opinion. And we got somewhere, somebody told us, when you say tokenization for arts, that it doesn't sit well, because tokenization may be a correct technical term, but it seems to convey the notion of diminishing the importance, you know, bringing down the, you know, the value of the as of the work, so tokenization and 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 the person didn't like that because the person is a real art lover. I don't want you to tokenize anything I love. I don't want you to <laughs> commonize anything I love. You know, so so we changed it to democratizing access. She said, okay, I can live with that. So I think it's a very important question for real art lovers, and um, it's like the question of if we meet for a meeting, or we are meeting through Zoom. Is it still the same relationship? If I touch my money, cash with my hands, and I'm doing virtual electronic money, is it still the same thing? So I think this con these conversations will continue, but uh, like somebody said, the underlying asset is always arts, and we can build all sorts of opportunities on top of it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Sheung. And I think with that, we'll go to the next agenda on the, on the, uh, for the day, the panelist discussion, which will be anchored by none other than Oinda Mola Fake. Oinda, please. Round of applause for her. Thanks, Oliver. And actually, thank you to the last speaker, and uh, thank you for the last question as well, because I think that that's where we're going to kick off um, our panel discussion and you know the conversation that is NFT and crypto art really art. Um, and so for the for this panel, I'm going to um, just welcome my esteemed 
panelists, and I'm going to kick off with Hannah Omilani, um, who is the founder of Lasmara, uh, an independent consultancy firm specializing in contemporary African art. And through this platform, she has also established Impart Artists Fair to promote fusion of art and technology. Omilani grew up in Frankfurt and first studied international relations at the University of Warwick before completing a master's degree in business psychology. Omilani previous, has previous experience, um, including a stint at Haunch on, of Venison, uh, a respected modern art gallery run by Christie's. So can I invite Hannah to join us on the panel? And while Hannah is coming up to the stage, I will introduce Ngozi Aderikwe. Uh, Ngozi is a partner of the law firm Jackson, Etty, and Edu. Uh, she's the head of commercial intellectual property um, and is the sector head of technology, media, and entertainment. Her expertise cuts across the value chain of origination, production, financing, marketing, and distribution of creative works. Ngozi is highly rated by managing intellectual property in global ranking bodies for intellectual property lawyers. Um, she's an executive officer at MBA SBL Committee of Sports, Media and Entertainment. She is key to promoting awareness on legal aspects of creative businesses in Nigeria. Can I invite Ngozi to join us on the stage? And Asinachi, who's already um, come up in a few of the presentations today, is here with us. He is celebrated as one of Africa's leading crypto artists. His unmistakable style and unique color palette are inspired by Nigerian textiles, stories of hope, and a search for happiness. His works also address climate change, racism, and single parenthood. In 2018, he became the first Nigerian artist to showcase at the Ethereum Su Summit, a conference in New York that seeks to bridge the gap between technology and art through blockchain. So please welcome Osinachi to the stage. And last but by no means least, Michael Ugu is an investor and entrepreneur with experience in Nigeria's music and entertainment industry. He formerly he was the former former general manager of Sony Music Entertainment West Africa. And prior to this, Ugu was the CEO of Uroki, Uroking Limited, set up to re reorganize Nigeria's music distribution online. Ugu is also an investor in Free Me Digital, the premier third-party digital distribution company in Nigeria. He earned a master's degree in economic development from the University College London in 2007. He also studied at the Lagos Business School, Pan Atlantic University and Harvard Business School in 2016 and 2017 respectively. So can I invite Michael to join us on the stage? Thanks, Michael. Um, I don't know why they put me smack bang in the middle. I was going to just hide in the side. So thank you all for joining uh, today and this discussion. And I think it is important for us to actually kick off um, with the question that is this, is NFT art, is crypto art even something that we can consider to be art? Um, it's basically the plaguing question, I think, that has come up, um, you know, over the, the last couple of months as NFTs have exploded. Uh, and I'm going to ask Osinachi to really uh, answer that question as a crypto artist. Well, I'm sure you already know the answer to that, <laughs> as do a lot of people, because um, crypto art is art. Um, when the... Um, when the boom, when the whole thing about NFTs and all started blowing up um, last year, sometime last year, um, the term NFT or NFTs became more popular than crypto art. But um, a lot of people who have been creating in the space um, 
as far back as 2017, people like me, we prefer to go with the term crypto art because we feel that that term represents what you are making. Just as um, the traditional artist is making the painting, right? Then NFT becomes the technology through which you are um, selling this work on the blockchain. So what I make, which is crypto art or NFTs, if you prefer that term, they are art. Thank you. Um, and can you just provide a little bit of clarity in terms of the difference? You know, what is, I don't know, crypto art versus maybe gaming or graphic design? Because I think a lot of people are, are uncertain whether they're buying art or buying something maybe from a graphic designer. Well, um, I'm not going to speak for other artists. I will speak for myself. I create my work using Microsoft Word which makes it digital, right? And what I make essentially is digital art. Just as the person who has a canvas and has acrylic oil and whatever creates their painting, and that work is traditionally created, I create mine digitally. And that is crypto art. Now, when it comes to the term NFTs, NFTs is like um, a junction where various things meet. You see art coming there. You see wearables or fashion coming there. You see gaming coming there. You even see music coming there. We have NFT audios now, and so on. So um, when you say NFTs, NFTs is like you're talking about you're talking about a whole ecosystem. But when you bring it down, you can talk about um, you can talk about NFT art. You can talk about NFT audio. You can talk about um, NFT games. You can talk about NFT wearables or fashion. So um, crypto art really meets with other things where uh, NFT stands as what brings all of these together. Thank you so much. Um, I'm just going to go over to Hannah and just speak about, um, you know, you, you're in the art and technology space. And so, you, you, you know, you're already in the space. But have you seen any over the last, say, year or so, any changes in terms of collectors, uh, the way they're collecting or the way they're actually interacting with you in terms of the types of art um, that they're coming to you for? Um, I guess so when we, when we, you know, I'm assuming we're talking about non-fungible tokens being NFTs. So just to, you know, continue, um, NFTs, uh, digital certificates of authenticity create you know recorded on a blockchain network that actually have the ability to verify the authenticity and ownership of digital assets it could be properties it could be art it could be anything so in my opinion it, it's it, so in the art world um, nfts can be tokenized to create a certification of ownership for, um, you know, that can be bought and sold. So it's not just for buying purpose. Um, at the moment, I would say there are definitely far more that are selling than buying. Because the real question here is, um, as there is, you know, in my opinion, there is space for it and a rise in, in the Nigerian art, in the art market in Nigeria, there's definitely a hunger and interest and a rise um, in the NFT. The, the, what, we, you know, what we really need to ask ourselves here is, are traditional collectors actually really buying into this um, NFT world, into buying? Because we have a lot of young up-and-coming collectors who are very keen to enter the art world that wasn't so democratized and so accessible to many. So whilst there's a lot of interest and, and quite a few new collectors, I, d I don't actually know if, I can, if we can call them collectors yet because they're new buyers. So they haven't actually reached the level of collector status yet, if that can be said. So yes, there is an increase, um, but the real question is when will the traditional collectors veer into the art of uh, into the world of NFTs because until they do, in Nigeria at least, so in Africa, we don't quite have the the power in the NFTs to compete with the rest of the world yet. 
And do you, where do you see your role in that, in maybe uh, engaging with these traditional collectors? I, I think the role starts with the creators. You know, collectors are really the final stage in this whole chain. And I know for some reason in Nigeria, we like to talk about, about collectors all the time. But the reality is collectors are the minority with extreme power in this art world. In, in, in different areas, in different places in this world, sometimes it's the opposite. It's the artist that has the power, you know, referring back to the scarcity and, and the abundance. And so um, our role in Lasmara doesn't just lie within one particular, uh, you know, pillar in this whole structure. Our role is really to begin with the seed, with the creators, and then to present to collectors, and that requires quite a lot of it. So it, it, it stretches from, um, you know, mentorship to creators, to artists, to, to um, legal um, consultation, and also to, I guess, also facilitate uh, the sales then. So uh, we don't have a definite role in, in this whole world, I think. And it's far too early to really talk about, right, this is our role now, this is what we're doing. It's such a new phenomenon. And there are so many predictions happening. Um, it's still all open in the air. It could just be a simple you know, bubble that will bust very soon. Or it might be the future of art. We don't know yet. So we, we'll stay flexible. Thank you, Hannah. Um, so I'm going to go all the way around to the other side and say, Michael, are you a buyer or are you a collector? <laughs> um, <clears throat> I'm definitely a collector. Um, I, I guess, you know, I guess that, that, that's one of the reasons I'm, I'm, I'm on the panel as well. Um, I've been collecting NFTs or crypto art primarily um, since about, you know, since early last year or so. Um, when I became aware of it, I had actually, you know, for me, I'd... I don't see myself as a traditional art collector, but I think that um, I've been an investor, not I think I know, I've been an investor in cryptocurrencies for a while. And so I'm aware of, you know, I got aware of different trends and different opportunities within the space. And I think, you know, like other, you know, crypto investors, you know, when the NFT wave kind of came around, the truth of the matter is, you know, some of us have done pretty well over the years. Um, and you know, not a, there's not a lot of things you can spend you know, ETH and Bitcoin on, right? And so for me, um, when I was trying to go out the risk curve outside of just investing in BTC and Ethereum, I started looking at other coins, I started understanding DeFi, which is decentralized finance, and I started understanding NFTs. And so I started you know, spread, my, you know, spread my investments a bit. Um, so DeFi is definitely more of an investment, but when I understood NFTs and I started buying, I was only buying for the love, right? because I, I saw it as a you know, pretty illiquid asset. Um, and I felt that if I'm gonna buy anything, I wanna be able to, to, you know, to actually you know, have it hanging in my home. And a lot of people, you know, I think they assume that you can't hang digital artworks in your home when you actually can. Right there, there frames like, a, like the mural fr frame, the Canva, and some other ones, I think the Infinity. Um, and I actually you know, made a space in my home that I hang my NFTs in. So when I'm buying artwork, um, yeah, I, I, I buy from a, from a collector standpoint. There are a lot of people who buy and flip, right? Um, I think, you know, we saw that with the, you know, a lot of the people, early people, open edition pieces. Um, they were bought and flipped, you know, for some pretty decent returns. Um, but I've never been that kind of investor. Even with my cryptocurrencies, I don't buy and flip. I generally buy and hold because um, that's my investment standpoint. So I'm definitely on the collector side, not the flipper side. And, and so thank you for speaking on the, the flipping and the, you know, collecting. And I mean, I think even in traditional art collecting as well, we are seeing, you know, people coming in as an investment and thinking about how they can, you know, how much money they can get out of the sale, you know, from, from, from the secondary market, I guess, of the work. So, um, I mean, we, we can kind of see. I consider that. Yeah. I, I definitely consider that. So when I'm buying, you know, artwork, it, you know, I have to love the piece, but the artist is also quite important, right? So I do research the artist that I buy, um, you know, so I've been able to, you know, I have pieces, I have about, I have about 85, you know, NFTs, um, and that's, like I said, primarily 
artwork, but I also, you know, I also invested in the CryptoPunk space, um, the Metaverse space, so, you know, Decentraland, and you know, like, like to tokenized um, land in, in, you know, on the Ethereum blockchain. Um, but yeah, I, I look at the artist's potential. I look at, you know, their standing in the art community. You know, um, I wish I'd bought more Sinachi pieces earlier. Um, oh, Sinachi is definitely one of the OGs. And, um, you know, it's been great to sit down with him and, like, hear his story. Um, but yeah, artists like Ferocious, um, Trevor Jones, um, Murat Pack, um, Billy Eilis, um, X Copy, you know, I was able to kind of like identify some of these artists as, you know, as, you know, having great potential. Um, you know, sad I missed out on, on the early Beeple pieces. But yeah, I look at the potential long term. Okay, if I do want to sell this on the secondary market in the future, it's an, it's an important factor. Um, but the most important factor is I have to love the piece first. And then the secondary one is will it hold its value and potentially appreciate in value? Thank you for that. Um, Ngozi, I'm just going to, um, you know, touch on some of the legalities of collecting. Um, and I think the, sp the last speaker spoke about, for instance, fraudulent transac transactions and, you know, people impersonating people. And what that resulted in was people having to burn their, bit burn their ether, burn their NFTs because um, the works were fake. So, i.e., I. there really was no... Um, there was no, you know, it, it no longer had value, basically. So could you touch a bit more on um, what NFTs, crypto arts have, what the kind of legal implications that um, are surfacing from this kind of collecting and this, this area of the art market? Okay, so um, thank you for that question. Can you hear me? Okay. Um, I think that we must look at NFTs as um, the way we look at many other transaction models, it, always, it comes with its risk, right? As much as it does have a lot of benefits, there are definitely risks, and these risks don't necessarily go away because the benefits are huge. So in this space particularly, this issue around copyright um, infringement is a problem because in the digital space already, where we are today, you have a lot of proliferation of digital works that are not proliferation by people who don't have any rights to you know, share this content online. And whilst um, you would agree that NFT provides a way to authenticate what is original, it is dependent on it having, it's dependent on the fact that the first copy that is tokenized was the original, or was presented by the original owner. Mm -hmm. And that's where the real problem is, because if there is a, if, there, if there's a breach at that stage, then you're proliferating what is incorrect, right? And then that's, that's a bigger problem. So it comes back to the artist understanding and the public also understanding what is proper. Um, the issues around copyright ownership don't go away, right? Even when you have a work, you've bought a piece of work, an NFT art, and you do not have um, the rights to reproduce that work, a lot of people think that by purchasing the work, you then have a right to share it online, you have a right to distribute, that isn't necessarily the case. So the traditional rules around copyright and traditional legal issues apply. However, it looks to me that um, the, the craze around NFTs and digital art has moved on way beyond the conversation around copyright in the digital world. And if you don't marry the two, if there is a misalignment, you would find very soon that you know, the whole essence, the value of, that, of this whole um, this idea is entrenched in there being a copyright system that is certain, one that we know for sure would reward the creator. And so we have to marry the two conversations. We can't move the technology ahead of the education around the copyright issues. Now, um, something else that actually is a risk factor apart from the, well, it's kind of tied to it. Um, someone had mentioned earlier that when you, when you get the, um, the NFT, when you, when you get the token, right, it is a means of identifying a particular piece of work. Mm. Now, it's the vehicle through which that transaction is happening. It doesn't necessarily convey with it um, any certainty around that work. So from a technical standpoint, you can even have a situation where the link, the, the, the link where that work is stored becomes unavailable. Right? And then there is a disconnection between the token because typically the token, the token um, as I understand it, is stored in a different place from the artwork itself. So it gives you access to the artwork if it authenticates your, your ownership 
of the license to the artwork, not necessarily ownership rights. I need to be clear on that. Um, but then you can also have a technical problem where that ownership is actually, you know, severed because of a technical difficulty in assessing the location. So these are issues that have legal implication. The, at the end of the day, the question is, what have you, what's the value of the token? What have you got? Is it a legal right? Or is it a, is it a legal right? Is a token in itself a legal right? Or does it give you access to, um, to a piece of art? And how clear are the licenses you know, that go with that? What's, what's the term that, that defines that? If you were doing a, if this was a, a, an off-site transaction, for instance, you would be clearer on the terms of engagement. But with the, in the digital world, it's not as easy to define those terms. And these are things that, you know, we need to begin to talk about now, you know, as we, as we advance on this, with this technology. Thank you for that. Um, and that makes me really think about your relationship with your buyers, um, Osinachi. Do you, um, is it a similar way, you know, in the traditional world, um, you know, generally there's patrons with artists, you know, do you build up relationships with your collectors? Um, and what is, what are some of the terms that you have for use of your work after it is minted? Yeah, um, there's the relationship between collectors um, what you need to know is that um, most collectors prefer to stay anonymous, right? And um, the communication is mainly done through Twitter and Instagram DMs, right? I can mint an artwork and someone comes and says, I want this, right? They want to buy it of how much, right? Or someone wants me to do a commission, they talk to me about it and if it's okay, if it's okay I go ahead and uh, make that and um, I've had um, collectors who came with other requests right the communication is there so, uh, it doesn't really um, stop the person from being anonymous they are still anonymous I don't know most of um, the collectors of my work they come with their names and all and 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 that's it so basically when um, when it comes to the rules to the game it is not, there is no, um, there is no constitution, let me put it that way. The only thing you can get um, are community guidelines presented by various platforms, like Super Rare, like Maker's Place, where they say these are community guidelines, you have to follow these if you want to be on this platform as a collector, as a creator. And, um, but what we've seen, what is obtainable right now, especially how I do my work, is that I like to say that my work has two lives, which is the physical and the digital. The digital is on the blockchain, so I mint the work on an NFT marketplace and someone buys. That's digital. And then I go ahead to work, maybe on my own or with a gallery, to produce physical prints, limited edition prints of that work. And other buyers in the physical art world can buy the limited edition of that same work. Sometimes there is, the, um, there is the arrangement with the collector of the digital piece who says, I want to buy a bundle. A bundle meaning that they want the physical print and they also want to buy the digital uh, print of that work on the blockchain. Generally, no collector in the NFT space comes into the space believing that once they buy a work, they can go ahead and reproduce it, maybe limited edition prints and sell. No, it ends with just buying the work. And the only benefit you get as a collector is to show it off that you have this work and then to resell if you wanted a secondary art market for a higher value. And at the end of the day, just as you mentioned flippy, uh, flipping, um, the artist gets a 10% royalty. So if the work sells by 1 p.m. and is flipped by 2 p.m., the artist need, needs not to worry. I mean, they are getting their 10% royalty. Um, I, I love that you ended with that because obviously I'm not a gallerist. I work in the contemporary art space. So, you know, I am all for artists making money, you know, uh, and of course, you know, most galleries are afraid of um, this NFT space because it's changing the gatekeepers. Um, it's removing um, the role, I guess, of you know traditional galleries um, in terms of the art sales. Um, but would you say that it's actually helping or hurting traditional art galleries? And I'm going to throw that to Hannah. 
Um, it depends what the art gallery focuses on, really, mm -hmm. and how they and and how they um, operate. So, if you have a genuine gallery that has really good relationships with their artists and actually really goes through the mentorship um, and everything, so and is not just after exploiting an artist. Um, then they are more than happy, be, you know, for this advancement because everybody benefits from this. If you have a good working relationship with your your artist, that as a gallery, that means you can also benefit from this. You can you can throw it out into your database of collectors, um, which the artist might have a very limited one of. So both can benefit from this because it's not NFTs are not exclusive to artists. So we have to remember that this is really open to galleries as well. So, uh, you know, but if you're a gallery that is after uh, quick money and exploitation and, uh, and nothing else, and not the long-term, um, you know, advancement of an artist or the artwork or the value of it, then you might be disappointed as, uh, you know, uh, quite frankly, NFTs do liberate artists, which is a great thing, especially for African artists who might struggle to enter the art market in the world because of so many bias, you know, as, we, as we're learning more and more through current movements and that are actually now outspoken because the reality is there are many bias in the art world towards uh, our continent and our creators. So it's only now with the movements of BLM that many things are being touched on. So um, yes, some galleries definitely will be threatened, but those who are open and who have genuine interest in, in, in uh, their business as well as the artist livelihood they would welcome this and and actually really try to work together thank you um, Ngozi I wanted to just speak about the minting process um, and would you encourage artists if they were represented by a gallery for the gallery to mint on their behalf or would you say that it's something that they should do themselves in terms of ownership um, you know, in terms of derivatives and, you know, sales as they go on. Okay, so um, I have to, you know, start by admitting that these technologies are disruptive. Mm -hmm. And um, it's like a wave of water. There's nothing you can do to stop it. Uh, we might have, we might start off, you know, by trying to maintain order as we've known it. But the truth is that the market will redefine itself. And um, whilst you, you might have galleries that would want to um, mint on behalf of, of artists. To Anna's point, right, the whole essence of NFT, not, maybe not the essence, but the byproduct of, of this technology is that artists are liberated and it means that they get more reward for the work they do. And um, there is a, an instinctive, um, for, for most artists, clearly, you would prefer to be able to assess the market, particularly if you are able to. And now this isn't a question of access because um, one of the benefits galleries have is to give access to artists, right, and to to um, provide them access to the market. In this case, you have access to the market, and it's not just a local market. So whilst I, I might say at this stage, okay, you you would depending on the agreement you have with um, the galleries, and I, I say to artists that um, don't assume you can't negotiate the terms of engagement you have with. Um, the galleries because um, every contract is different and even though you might be served with a standard template you should always try to get whatever advantage you, you get so you need to look at the advantages you get pr based on what you have signed up to and see whether those advantages are still whether they still become advantages in the light of you know NFT, uh, NFTs and the, the light of um, um, crypto art and the possibilities that there is there. There isn't a clear answer to that question I think I would I would look at that question based on a number of, of um, variables, primarily um, the engagement that there presently exists. Um, but just speaking generally, I don't see why an artist wouldn't want to, you know, access the market directly, um, unless there is a disadvantage that I, I ha I'm not aware of. But just can speaking. I, can I generally. add to this? Yeah, please. Uh, I think there are conflicting views regarding this. Um, yes, why is NFTs or you know? liberate artists, right, to directly access a, a market, and not just a local one, but globally, as you mentioned. Um, you know, when there's, usually when there's a big hype around something, especially in the art world, as we know, 
I think sometimes it helps to actually slow down and examine things with a cool head. Because yes, it's, 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 an hype, it's a hype now. And whilst it's an easy transformation for digital artists or digital art, right, to be uh, tokenized, to, to be sold as NFTs, this connection is actually very difficult for traditional artists. So it's not as straightforward for a traditional artists to think, all right, let me, you know, I've just finished with my oil painting on my canvas, so how can I now sell it? On any, it's, it's a very tricky market, and, and um, quite often, traditional art, well, artists that create traditional artworks uh, don't even know where to start with. I mean, we get questions like, what is NFT? Well, you know, yes, we know you can Google it, but artists function completely differently. So why it's its common sense to some, it's the traditional artwork, it's very tricky to transform it to tokenizing and making uh, profits. So, um, you know, um, galleries are needed for some artists, um, just, you know, as galleries are not needed for other artists. Um, that transformation is, is not as straightforward for many. And what galleries also actually provide is not just a tool of collectors and, and, and buying power and, or artists for collectors, but they, they actually also provide legal um, advice, which they have the, the, you know, they have the ability to reach out to their uh, legal advisors, which for an artist is quite, unenam you know, you, artists can't imagine paying uh, legal fees to a lawyer. I mean, you guys are very expensive. So, you know, for an artist to pay a legal advisor to even explain what the contract in this NFT is saying is very, very tricky because some NFTs, if you're not careful, do not have, don't, they don't grant the copyright um, access that, that, you know, digital artists or quite literate, you know, artists in the digital world are very aware of. Some NFTs come without the copyright uh, uh, grant. So they could easily lose out. I mean, they, they can sell the certificate of ownership to one party. However, it doesn't mean that replication will be stopped because their contract may not have included it. So a gallery can actually assist you in that. If I may chime in, okay. sorry. Um, I don't get, I'm, I'm not comfortable when um, galleries want to get involved in artists entering the NFT space. Number one, the number one rule in the NFT space is the decentralization, which means that um, an artist can go in and do their thing without a third party. Now, when a gallery mints a work on behalf of an artist, there is a problem there, right? The problem is the origin of this work on the chain, on the blockchain. It is supposed to be the artist's wallet address. Each wallet address is unique. If you have a wallet, your address is unique. Now, collectors want to be sure that what they are collecting is truly coming from the artist. So when you look at a work, for example, a resignation on Super Rare, you go down to the history of this work, you're going to see it originated from Osinachi by my unique wallet address and then this person made an offer to buy it for this amount. Every transaction, every offer until it's sold is recorded there. Now, when that work is resold in the secondary market, I get a 10% automatically. Nobody, I don't have to email anybody and say, send me my 10%, I saw that the work has resold. So when a gallery does that on behalf of the artist, it means 10% goes to the uh, gallery. And it might become a bone of contention between the gallery and the artist, where the artist is now asking for the 10% to be sent to them. And no collector, in fact, would want to buy from to buy a work that was minted by a gallery. But this doesn't mean that galleries don't have their roles in the space. I work with a gallery in Switzerland. The role of a gallery in the NFT space, if you ask me, aside from uh, partnerships that I do with my own gallery. I mean, they make limited edition prints of my work, and then they can say, uh, Osinachi, we have this collector who wants to enter the NFT space but does not understand it, right? Now, it is their role as a gallery that understands the space to educate the collectors from the traditional art space who want to enter the NFT space. And they can help them also set up everything they need 
And at the end of the day, it's a partnership between the gallery and the artist. And the gallery takes a cut when the work is sold because of the role they have played. Also, that applies to the legal role and every other thing that the gallery can do. So I believe that when it comes to how the space works with this decentralized nature in collaboration with the traditional art space, there are rules for everybody. But then the gallery should not mint an artist's work. It flaunts the whole thing about, it, it flaws the whole thing about um, decentralization right from the start. Can I, can I just clear on um, what Hannah said about um, the fact that traditional artists are more comfortable with, you know, well, or they are not as, as educated in the digital arts space. It makes me wonder how uh, because in this case, we're, all, we're talking about digital art. So first of all, it's not, it's not traditional art. It's not tangible in the sense that um, you have the canvas with you, right? Um, are, are you thinking about they, they, they being able to convert what is tangible art into digital art? Or is this original digital art from the start? So I wasn't referring to digital art only. I was referring to NFTs okay. in the art market. So being non-fungible tokens, which can also apply to traditional art, because it's, 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 um, it's a transfer of, you know, it's a certification of ownership that you're transferring, right? It's not the actual traditional piece. So, you know, as, as an example was mentioned earlier, you know, an artist can actually enter, uh, you know, or be in both spaces. The NF, you know, the, the crypto world, you know, selling NFTs, but also selling um, digital art. I mean, uh, but in in the you know, in the touchable sense. Yeah. So um, that's what I meant by traditional artwork. So it's it's the NFT of the traditional artwork. Okay, sorry, I wasn't trying to take your place. I just need to be clear on that. Thank you. Yeah, I think this conversation has actually been really interesting. Um, so I, again, I said my background was in, with working with vid video artists, sound artists, you know, people who traditionally make installation works that, um, you know, could be deemed as an ephemeral. So I, I, I understand what you say in terms of like digital, but in the tangible s sense, and then we're talking about NFTs. And, and what I've seen actually is that traditional artists are seeing this boom um, and actual access to income as well. Um, and they are actually thinking about how can they transition from being traditional artists or offline artists, um, uh, tangible artists into this NFT space. So really we are having like, um, I guess two sets of people now working on this platform, people who are traditional digital artists and people who see NFTs as an opportunity for income generation. And is that a problem? And is that really the issue that we're facing here where people are saying that, you know what, I'm just gonna, just by you know making it high res it's automatically you know this art form whereas someone like Osinachi is actually creating for the platform purposeful work um, and i think it touches on the conversation that came from the audience in that is is this real art or is this commercialization of art um and then who is you know where's that where is the you know start point because if the start point is from investors or businessmen you know, it goes down one route, but if the start point is actually artists and there's now this opportunity for them to create income, is that really bad? Uh, and I throw this out to the whole panel. Well, um, if uh, we're talking about um, traditional versus digital, um, every artist, in fact, every creator, right? We've seen people put selfies on NFT marketplaces for sale, right? So every collector has a space in there, has a, has a place in the NFT space. Uh, Trevor Jones is one of the leading artists in the NFT space. He makes his work traditionally, right? He paints on canvas, and then he goes ahead to create a digital version of this work. I don't know how his process goes, but I would assume that he takes a high-res image of the work, and then goes on to create an animation of the work. So that there is a difference if you want to look at it like that, or so there's an addition of something when you're looking at the NFT piece. It's animated. There's a movement. 
as opposed to the steel image that he also gets to sell, right? So um, that also doesn't mean that an artist who doesn't have the skill sets to create animation cannot enter the space. I mean, once you take a high-res image of the work and you put it on an NFT marketplace, it's beco it becomes crypto art because it's on this space. And that doesn't prevent you from selling um, the physical art piece. But I, I, I'd like to think that it has implications in terms of an artist who started tradition, who is traditional in the process of creation and has a gallery before they enter the space. And then they'll have this work they just made, which they consigned to their gallery, and then they go on to put it on the NFT um, marketplace i think there are implications i don't know the legal implications but i've been in the space and it was through the space that my gallery um discovered me and that means they understand how the space works and we just roll with that um yeah i think i'll chime in as well so i think from that commercialization perspective you know i think recently we've actually seen a slowdown in the nft space um, to be quite honest, um, we've seen some reversals um, with regards to you know some hyped pieces, and you know I do agree that there's a little bit of um, hype um, in the space right now, and I honestly think that I don't know 98% of NFTs don't have much value, if I'm being very honest, right? Um, I think you know value will accrue to you know the top artists, the you know the, the top creators who are actually creating meaningful work. Like I've seen a lot of these um, even so. I'm in the music business, right? And I've seen a lot of cash grabs, should I say, from artists, um, you know, from musicians, from other players. I think Ellen um, DeGeneres literally tried to sell an, or she's selling an NFT of like a cat. And I mean, yes, people collect spoons, keep, people collect stamps and, you know, all kinds of interesting things. But I think that, you know, there is, you know, there is that danger. And I think, you know, for collectors in the space, um, you know, they should be quite careful. Um, and I think that it's gonna take, you know, while I think someone said earlier that it's still very early. Um, I do think that, um, you know, the crypto art market will, you know, destabilize the traditional art market. Um, but that's probably after all the noise has died down. Um, a little bit of history has been built up. You know, some, you know, some things have been proven. And I think, um, you know, the understanding of, you know, how do I buy, where do I buy type of thing, you know, kind of like develops. So yeah, I do, I do think there is a little bit of over-commercialization right now. I have actually slowed down um, my, my collecting. So I think at some point, I just started to get all kinds of messages, um, you know, just shilling me their, their work, you know, just hitting me up. Sorry, shilling just means just marketing me their work, you know, via DM and, you know, these are lazy pieces. There's, there's nothing behind it, there's no history. And I think some, some of the new artists are seeing this whole kind of like, oh wow, the NFT space can kind of like liberate me. I, I, I understand, yes, that that is part of it, but it doesn't mean you should be lazy about what you create. And I do think that, you know, that, you know, we are gonna see the growth of curators in the space. And I think that, you know, the, the galleries have an important role to play with regards to what happens in that curation space, because there's gonna be so much stuff out there, right? It's like the music industry, like years ago, you'd probably go into HMV or whatever. Now you go into Spotify, there's 40 million tracks. You need a playlist, you need someone to curate all of that content. And as more, more people dive into the space, um, whether traditional, whether digital, you know, wherever they're coming from, even you know, there's gonna be you know, guys who are just looking at, oh, I can make money out of this, right? The noise is gonna pick up, and it has picked up a lot. So people are just putting out a lot of junk. Um, and, and I think I did notice that um, Osinachi had, had, it wasn't putting out as much stuff. Um, and, and, and I had seen some commissions. And I'm, you know, some people who, are, who collect like me are actually watching what artists are doing. Um, so Trevor Jones put out what the Bitcoin angel um, I believe earlier this year and he actually said he's not putting out any other work this year at all. And you know he's created this discord group that's you know has created a community around this piece of piece of art and, um, and and I see that as being the way forward as opposed to this these cash grabs and this over commercialization and this over hype that I think is happening in the space right now. Thank I think you just to add to this um, an example could be the fractional ownership of art in China where there's there was you know there was a massive hype uh, at some point and some may say it has failed because there was such a hype but it just didn't work for them does it mean it nfts won't work i don't think so does it mean that nfts can't work for us in nigeria and africa absolutely not because i um 
I believe with the growing you know, digital awareness of our young population, and we have to remember that Nigeria's uh, uh, average age is under 19. I mean, these are native digital uh, guys. They, they, you know, they're very comfortable with technology, very comfortable with the language, with, you know, whereas a, tradi you know, a, a traditional collector would be completely lost. So with, with that in mind, I think there is, there is space in the art market uh, for rise in NFTs here. But again, you know, we need to be very careful and, and slowly, especially on the investment side, um, you know, just to add to your point, to really look at quality rather than just quantity and hype. Um, but, you know, I'm sure you know from your own field, um, the increase in, in VR artists, you know, uh, art, you know, artists who Actually, I'll call them new artists because these are guys that used to be in the marketing department of a company that were creators, always known as cre creators in the office, right? Suddenly can sell their, their, um, their assets. I mean, they, they can become freelancers and, and, and do their things. Um, we've seen from Impact, you know, in 2019, when we said art meets West, uh, I mean, art meets um, technology, the idea was that we give a platform to all artists, but especially to those who are not being looked at, I mean, digital artists. But in thinking of digital artists only, we came across, you know, video artists, sound artists, you know, all sorts of different types. Uh, in the end, we had a whole fair with, you know, VR, AR, um, we had a virtual tour that actually, not just collectors, but also galleries, especially in America, North America, were viewing life and actually acquiring about local artists because for the first time, they had access directly. You know, whereas before, you had to know a gallery in the country that could take you to the artist. Um, but when you do a virtual tour, uh, when you do, you know, uh, uh, v um, VR or a AI or AR, these are all tools that really enable you to share your works with others. But, you know, artists have to really focus on creating, you know, especially in Nigeria. I, I, you know, there is a tendency to look at the end goal first rather than at the creation. And I, and I always say that to artists because at the end of the day, your works will speak for itself. Whether it's, it's NFTs, digital, traditional, you will make a good living if you produce quality. But that's what artists should really focus on, which is easier said than done in this environment. Yeah, I mean, that's one of the reasons that CCA was started was, you know, to encourage criticality and critical thinking in, in practice, especially when it comes to art. We, you know, it's one thing to be a great draftsman, you can paint, um, you know, a great, I don't know, market scene, but can you think, you know, and you bring in that thinking to your work? And I think that that's what uh, maybe Michael's talking about as well in terms of your collection and why you collect the works that you do because there's some thought put, it back, put into it. And I think that that is when we can start interrogating that is this work art or isn't it um, because of the thinking and because of the nature uh, of, of why that work was created and you know what, what the creation ultimately was. Um, I do agree that there is a role for curation as well in terms of the marketplaces as well. Um, they're really wide and it, you know, about having that kind of curated content and having um, spaces that are populated that can draw eyes like the Discord group that you spoke of as well. Um, I think that brings about um, interest, especially in the work. And I know recently um, We Are Masters, for instance, they are now trying to do something along the lines of, you know, having a marketplace you know, dedicated to African artists. So um, I think with that, we've had a really interesting conversation here on the stage. Maybe we throw it out to the audience if there are any questions from you that you'd like to post to the panel. Good evening, everybody, again. Julius Yeoje is my name. I would say from my own point of view as a gallerist, um, Charles, your fears, don't worry. This was a conversation that happened some hundred years ago in the 18th century. When photography came in, photography came in and people said, oh, photography will kill art. It's going to be portrait that you have to sit for hours to be painted now with a few minutes your pictures are taken. But digital art is existing about 15, 20 years now. It's still existing. Everything will run in parallel. People that love traditional art will go for traditional art in the next 600 years. 
people that will embrace digital space will go for the digital space. Traditional artists would never, some of them would never go to the digital space. Some people in the digital space will never go to the traditional space. Some we, you, you, we have some artists that are uh, sculptors and painters. Some people will do both. Whatever your space is, the summary is that just be good in whatever you are doing. That's what I would say. Thank you. Th thank you for the presentation. Uh, I have a question about like uh, the crypto art market. Uh, when we see, for example, uh, Elon Musk just tweet once uh, about Bitcoin and then he, uh, the, the court of the Bitcoin increased so much in, just in one day, do you think like the crypto art market is more sensitive with like external influences, like influencers, and at which points that be a problem on the market? Because uh, it means like if you just get a friend or someone while that influence of the market, you can increase the value of your NFT so much, so it can disrupt the Z hard market. Thank you. Yeah, um, there are of course the role of influencers in the crypto art market. They are actually whales, people who are crypto rich. Um, the crypto art scene was just there. Basically, there were little sales until this big collector called Whale Shark came on and started buying pieces for crazy amounts. Now, once Whale Shark started doing that, a lot of collectors took notice and people who weren't even in the space before took notice. So, um, as an artist, you'd be praying for a Whale Shark offer on your work because it brings a lot of attention because Well Shark, who is crypto rich and is collecting so much and paying so much for these digital artworks, has taken interest in the work. Uh, whereas when, for example, if he doesn't take interest, right, um, there isn't there isn't much action on that work. Um, as far back as um, late 2019, early 2020 the tradition in the space was that um, as an artist you maint your work and then you have to do the promotion right and uh, you go on twitter and tweet we used to tag these people whom we regarded as uh, the big collectors uh, to actually take notice of what we're doing some of them found it annoying i mean nobody does that in the space anymore maybe a uh, new entrance and um, we can understand why people were tagging them right because they want this person's seal of approval which would of course help in the value of the work uh there's an artist who blew up in the space a young artist who blew up in the space just because someone who is big in the technology space in the cryptocurrency space commissioned them to do a work and that was where they took off from so they have their roles i'm sure the same thing happens in the traditional art space and I just think influencer marketing influences every industry and is disrupting every industry. Yeah, so yeah. Um, um, my name is Michael. Any different? I'm an artist. Uh, I just want to make a contribution to what you guys say about the galleries and the artists. So I think the galleries have roles because there are platforms now that have split royalties. So um, you could have a split royalty of maybe 2% for the gallery. Um, Ten percent. You can have all. Like, if you have like maybe an animation, and someone maybe did an After Effects work, someone did the sound, someone did the 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 the, the, um, the compilation. You could have split royalties for every creative on that project. So there are different platforms now, and um, I don't think um, the, the battle between gallery and artist and the digital art space is going to be a problem in this in, 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 in right now. Bro presently now in the, in the crypto art space. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, my name is Choma, um, and I just recently got to know about NFT like three days ago. Um, I, I, I found out that this is straight up my alley. Um, my work is a bit of a hybrid. It starts out as uh, traditional, hand-drawn, and then it ends up in the digital space, and then it comes back to traditional. And within these three days, I've created my own account, uh, my own Ethereum account, and I'm trying to 
put up by work and much of the questions that has been asked has been I, I have has been answered um, but I have a question for Mr. Sinachi uh, and then another question for the house um, is it okay for Sinachi the question is are there strategies for promoting your work on the crypto market because one of the things I noticed um, and like he, the other speaker had pointed out was that there's a lot of junk Right, people are putting up all sorts of stuff, and, and I, I was kind of put back when I got into the market. I'm like, okay, so how do we differentiate? But again, I understand that the quality of your work, uh, the storytelling, would help. Now, are there strategies for translating who you are as a as an artist, as a brand, from the physical space to the crypto space, the digital space? That's the um, uh, the question I have. And then the other thing I wanted to add was that I, I don't think there's much of an issue. Um, it was easy for me to set up because I happen to be a hybrid person. I, I, I understand tech and have my way around them. And I know how hard it will be for a traditional artist to do it, having gone through it. Um, I, I don't think it would be necessarily easy for galleries to do that because they are not structured to do that. Uh, they would have to then get in tech savvy persons in their in their organization to be able to help them do that for their artists. So I, I don't think we have much of a problem there. I think it's something we need to observe, um, especially against the backdrop of regulations from the APX bank and all of that. So yeah, but my question is, are there strategies of translating who you are as a traditional artist in the art space physically to the crypto space? Or do you just go in and there and then just start tagging and you know? Yeah, thank you. Um, if you are big in the traditional art space, you're certainly going to be big in the, in the NFT art space. That is one thing I've come to notice. Um, imagine if someone like Banksy announces that they are, he's putting out uh, an NFT, right? The space is going to go crazy. If Picasso was alive and said, I'm putting out an NFT, of course, you can imagine how it's going to be. If Kainde Wiley wakes up tomorrow and says, I'm putting out an NFT, it's going to be huge. So um, if you're a big name in the traditional art space, you are certainly going to be big, no matter the quality of what you actually put in the space. But then if you are someone who is just starting out, or who is just there in the traditional art space, you have a lot of work to do and that means you have to build a collection. First of all, you should come in with a strategy, right? Your strategy is to build your work in such a way that the value increases as you are putting out work. Because collectors want to see the value. It's like, it's like buying Bitcoin. You wouldn't be happy if the value of Bitcoin continues to go down. As a collector who is collecting NFTs, you want to see Osinachi going up, probably Three months ago, you bought an Osinachi for three either. You would be so happy if you saw an Osinachi go for 20 either today. And that is what it's about. So you as an artist, your strategy is for you to come in and build this. And what I often tell people is make work from your heart. There's this issue that I've been seeing in the space since it blew up. And that is people coming out and saying, um, coming out and saying to me, Hey, I've been creating, I was creating art when I was in primary school. Or I was creating art when I was in nursery school. I think I can do this. Because they are seeing the money, right? And they want to come in and grab, right? Uh, that is not the right way to go. If you're an artist, you're an artist. You've been making art from whenever you've been making art. I've been making art before I even knew what cryptocurrency was, before I knew what blockchain was, before I knew what crypto art was. So that, that is it. Um, you go in and mint your artwork. You tweet. A lot of collectors won't be happy if you enter their DM. They might not even reply you. But at the end of the day, if your work is authentic, it's going to speak for itself. It doesn't mean you don't have to do some work on your own promoting the piece because you have to compete with other people who are creating junk. And the funny thing is that those people making junk in the space are the noisemakers that would want to drown your own voice as someone who is making authentic work. So you have to like, much of the community is on Twitter. So just tweet and tweet. That's what I keep telling people. And um, that is it. Make authentic work. Your work will speak for itself. Sorry, uh, I'll add something to that as well from, from my perspective. Um, I, I also believe, like when, when I look at um, younger 
um, um, crypto artists coming up, I look at who they associate with and the communities they're building with other artists. You know, I've bought work just off the back of the fact that one of my favorite artists mentions another artist, right? So I don't always necessarily wait for the hype. And I mean, then you get, you, you, you can pick up great work at great value. And I think that, you know, other artists have, you know, have a great eye for, you know, what, 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 what's potentially, you know, a beautiful piece, right? So I think um, definitely don't operate in a silo you know, get around like-minded artists. And I wouldn't say go and chase after the big, big, big boys. I'd say, you know, find artists who are, you know, just as good as you or just, just a little bit ahead of you or at your level and then say, okay, fine, how do we build these relationships? How do we build a community and how do we move forward? Um, I, I think, you know, just in the little time I've been in this space, or the, the space is, in, I think, was 2017? It really picked up, right? I think, you know, so, so what I've seen is that, you know, communities are very important um, and recommendations are very important. So yeah, definitely everything he said, um, but also you know relate with other young artists. I, I see some very interesting Nigerian artists, you know, coming up, and I, I've literally come across them um, in some of Osinachi's workshops, um, and, and off the back of things like that, I get to find out about someone's work, and and then I start looking at how they're progressing in the community. Um, sometimes reach out, sometimes I don't buy a piece straight away, but I support. Um, so yeah, definitely don't be too aggressive with people. You know, just appreciate the support. And, um, and just build those relationships. Thank you. Uh, first, thank you for that uh, great, brilliant panel. Uh, as Mr. over there, um, I wasn't aware of NFTs and crypto art before today, and this has been really insightful. Um, for, of course, now I have like many questions uh, popping up in my mind now. I guess, I have a double interrogation goes to my question goes to Anna and Michael. As we know today and for like ever now, the marketplace, art marketplace, I'm talking traditionally, is really uh, close into itself. It's really hard for any artist or young galleries or even young collector to access, right? And as you said, uh, the crypto art and F NFTs could be really liberating for artists to enter as a marketplace, um, in which uh, major means, from your point of view, uh, this, this new disruptive market uh, could be you know, more democratized than the traditional one. And on the other part as well for collec collection, collectors, because it's a digital way and it's uh, virtual, right? I mean, based on internet, let's say, I guess there's a kind of a cons consortium going on, maybe. I don't know if you can say that. Like, like if I go on Instagram, Instagram will only reflect to what I like and what I've been liking for ads or new accounts to suggest. So is it the same thing about discovering artists and new artworks in this marketplace? Is, is there any kind of a cons consortium or not? Thank you. Okay. Um, so, so yeah, yeah. I think I understand what you're saying in terms of, like, the Instagram algorithm that kind of like makes recommendations, like Facebook does and what have you. Um, I, I don't really. I think you know. Yes, if you're on platforms like Nifty Gateway and Super Rare, I mean, they just position, you know, hyped artists, big artists, more than anything. I don't think there's any specific algorithms within within these platforms yet. Um, I, I'm more of a you know a, a manual collector. I I find communities. Um, you know, I, I do see stuff on Nifty Gateway, but I find a lot of stuff on, on Twitter um, and on Discord. You know, I get into these communities and, you know, people just start talking about this particular artist. And, and you know, some of the, the, the OGs, you know, it, it's, it's such a young space that OGs are literally from 2017. Because um, I believe that that's when, you know, some of the minting started, like, you know, Osinachi, like Hakatao, um, Coldy, um, X Copy, you know, there's, 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 there's a few of them. Um, so I've never really been aware of any kind of like algorithmic recommendations on, on things. Um, there could be. I, I don't know if, I don't think OpenSea, OpenSea is more like an open marketplace. I think Nifty Gateway, I may have seen something like recommendations, you know, down the bottom, possibly Maker's Place. But I don't take much, you know, interest in that because they generally tend to put the artists that will drive the most attention, whether that's, you know, a Grimes or, 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 or you know, a big DJ, you know, RAC or, or some of these other big names. And then um, even on Super Rare, you know, there's some artists that 
you know, you, you'd never potentially see them on the front page of Super Rare. But if you just do some digging and try and find out who's collecting and, you know, what, what communities they're building, you know, you find great stuff. Um, so, yeah, a bit different from, from IG for me personally. So if I understand your question correctly, you're, you're asking how, how can artists be liberated w with this or? I mean, um, especially not with uh, Bitcoin. So I'm guessing uh, as we look at the art marketplace, the art marketplace right now, for someone who doesn't have you know, the, the, the um, education about how it works, it's really difficult to enter and to work around it. So I'm guessing because now it's another marketplace for art, but involving tokens, Bitcoin, which is, you know, that not easy to understand for like most of us, I guess, you know, when you're not part of this thing. Do you think, because you said it was liberating, which I, I understand, but do you think it, this kind of market can be dem more democratized than, than the traditional one for artists and collectors and galleries? Um, absolutely. I mean, that I think this is actually a question to you, more than uh, to me, but to answer it briefly, but you can add a bit if you want. Uh, it's, it's definitely liberating and it's far more democratic because, I mean, in simple terms, it's kind of like opening an Instagram account, right? So there's, there's no manual before you actually start to create the account that tells you this is how it works, do this, do that. I mean, of course, you have a few YouTube videos, but step by step as you embark on the process of actually on the journey of you know opening these accounts you'll have terms and conditions and 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 everything you need to know so it's it's far more democratizing because you can just access it straight away you don't have to go to a, a you know third party i mean you, you don't have to get to another person to get you to a third party or or you don't have to approach someone else to introduce you to you know the what the art world that you don't know how to get to it's it's right in front of you it could be on your phone on your on, on any devices yeah if i may add um of course it democratizes the whole um thing about art i started out um emailing and emailing a lot of galleries as far back as 2016 a lot of art institutions, especially in Nigeria, most of them didn't reply. The little replies I got weren't favorable. That was until I discovered crypto art. And through crypto art, I was able to do what, do even more than these galleries could do for me if they had taken me on, right? So um, it just democratizes that. It also democratizes the enjoyment of art. I mean, in the traditional space, someone buys a Picasso and goes ahead to lock it up in a vault. Nobody can see it except them when they want to. But with crypto art, the collector buys it and another person can go and look at it on the collector's profile. Collectors are even building their own galleries in the metaverse to show off their collection, right? So they collect these, they collect that, they collect that, they have this virtual land in the metaverse and they build a gallery and they show their work there. There's something Mohammed Amin Foundation is doing, which is a cultural organization in Kenya, um, right now that I'm working with them on. They want, to, they want to put out NFT drops of their archive, which are exclusive photographs that, were, that was taken by Mohammed Amin when he, when he was alive, right? And um, what this means is, the NFT space through things like this that cultural organizations are doing is going to change how you have access to archives like this. I mean, a professor in Harvard doesn't need to fly down to Kenya to look at this photo of um, Nelson Mandela just as he was leaving the prison, right? He can look at it from wherever he is and also teach with it. But at the end of the day, someone owns this work. It, do, it doesn't belong to the professor, but it saves him the trouble of having to come down to the archive to look at this work, right? So it democratizes art in, when, when it comes to how artists are making their money, putting food on the table, and also how people enjoy art on its own. Actually, you know, yeah. yeah I, I wanted to add that, that accessibility thing, and yeah, like I said earlier, I'm not a, I'm not a traditional 
collector. I'm I'm the new age, I guess, collector, right? And you know, I I always I was aware of Christie's, I was aware of Th Sotheby's, you know, I was aware of all of these, the, you know, different galleries, you know, across across the world, and you know, you'd visit them, and you know, but it always felt inaccessible, right? And I think one thing for me, when I got to really understand NFTs in the crypto art marketplace, it was super accessible. I just needed Ether, which I had. I need, just needed primarily a Meta, MetaMask wallet, which I had. And I could actually see something and buy it from Lagos. And I'm getting access to some of the, you know, today I guess they'll be the most globally prolific crypto artists in the world. And I'm buying this stuff from Lagos. You, it's 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 you know the accessibility is is opened up a, a massive a, a completely new investment an asset class for me personally, right? You know I had been interested in investing in in traditional art, you know in terms of like you know the way art has worked as an inflation hedge for years, but the accessibility was just a thing, and I thought it was you know this big art world, you know a lot of hoity-toity snobbish type of people, and um, you know that's because I'm not in that world, but the crypto art space, you know in like it just gave me that accessibility. And I do, there there are a lot of similar similarities, um, yeah. And I've I've been for shows in Lagos, you know, some some of the galleries. I have commissioned some works, but yeah, it's just a comp completely different thing. So it does democratize. It does you know create accessibility. The internet and the blockchain has just unlocked a completely new market for collectors and for creators and for the whole ecosystem. I believe. I think also aside from just selling and buying, in terms of democratization. You just reminded me, you know, with your example at Impact, when we had our art fair, we had a digital exhibition of the Nigerian history, you know, but we focused on Ni Nigerian uh, presidents and, and chiefs. Um, and so we had a team from Abuja that came down and, and set up a digital exhibition of archived photography. Um, and what was, so, and we had it along a six meter by, you know, three, uh, u-shaped wall exhibited so we didn't have access to the archives we didn't have anything and we learned so much from from you know about the history of nigeria which are archived images like like you explained but what actually really went towards democratizing art was it was quite surprising we only invited three schools to come and view the art fair prior to opening but before we knew it, we had requests from 19 other schools that brought their schools, their classes, to come specifically to view this digital exhibition because of the subjects that they were teaching. So I think from these school, three schools, it just spread that you know kids can see this and it's open and it's free. So they, you know, in the space of three days, they actually each came in you know two, three hour slots, and at some point. I mean, we weren't planning group exhibitions. We hardly had any sponsor that was interested in art meets tech. I mean, they were looking at us like, what are you talking about? Because most sponsorship or funding comes from traditional artists, uh, traditional collectors who are interested in traditional art. So when you talk about you know, new means, uh, new, new methods, technology, they're just looking at you and thinking, what are we spending money on? This is not a champagne reception with you know, oil on canvas hanging. So, um, mm. you know, there's, there's another aspect to democratizing art, especially with your center as well. So it's, it's aside from the buying and collecting, which is really important for, for the art market, um, for the general uh, population, it's also quite educational and there's access for it. Mm. I think we have one last question. We, I know that, you know, overrun, but the conversation has just been so riveting. <laughs> so let's have the last question. Um, hi, my name is Sadiq Ajibola Williams. I'm a multidisciplinary artist. I've quite enjoyed every perspective here, but I, for me, I've been studying the NFT um, rave in the last three weeks, and I've heard like a particular word, liber liberation. To a degree, I, I agree about the democratization of what's happening, but I don't agree with liberation. And the reason I say this is, I'm a practicing martial artist also. I use it to create some pieces. I understand the transitions from traditional to the ephemeral, because I do movement art and I operate with, within all these spaces, music, poetry, etc. For you to be able to completely liberate yourself off of something suggests that you're constricted. And to a large degree, I disagree, because I practice Jeet Kune Do, and for 
you to get to a point where you're fluid, even with your expression or art or thought process or whatnot, you need to understand the basics or rudimentaries. I think from studying and talking to a few of my think tank groups, there is also a danger with this. If you do not understand rudimentaries or basics, and I think that's where the traditional space comes in, the galleries, lawyers, management, etc. Because if you could diving into this thing as a trend, which is great. I'm all about technology disruption, but the, the key thing I think people need to watch out for is what are you jumping into? Because the dark web, crypto space, it doesn't follow the same parameters and it's fantastic, but what are you, if you don't have like, like Michael pointed out, Jason has pointed out, if your work isn't great in real time, in the virtual digital space, does it translate? A lot of artists are jumping onto this. They're not, I personally feel they're not asking the right questions and they're not observing enough patterns. You've built a great body of work, so you're able to translate that. But if you don't have that in real time, on some level, it's a bit of a waste of time because it's only a means to an end. It's not necessarily be an end all. And I'm also a bit on the other side. While I appreciate these labels, why, is, why are we saying crypto art, digital art, etc.? Art is just expression, is it not, ultimately? Even in movement, painting, it's all expression. When we start putting these labels in, it's almost like saying, um, I'm going to hedge my bets here or whatnot. And I think it starts to get constricting. For me, that's the only sort of red flag I'm seeing. And my main question is, do we have enough info, intel, data, patterns to even start making suggestions about what's going to happen next? That's you know, one question I would like to ask. Does anyone here have a sort of like informed insight as to what could possibly happen in the next five years, 10 years? Anything. It's well, a in, in one billion dollar <laughs> question. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm no prophet, but um, let me use my own career in this space as an example. 2017, right, there wasn't much attention in the NFT space. We had Crypto Kitties, we had Crypto Punks. Uh, 2018, the space is still growing. There's Ethereal Conference in New York. Uh, 2019, the little money starts trickling in. As at then, the, the, the value of either was even like, I think it was less than $170. And then it keeps growing and growing until people's ex Christie's. And for, from my own perspective, if you, I think basically what you're asking is, is it a bubble or is it not? So what I, what I keep telling people when that question comes up is, whether it's a bubble or it is not a bubble, 10 years from now, 20 years from now, 30, 50, 100 years from now, people are going to be making art and putting art on the blockchain. And people are still going to be collecting art on the blockchain. That is, that is what I can say. When it comes to insights about data, uh, there are collectives that are coming up. I know about one off. One off. You can check them. Yeah, you can check them on Twitter. One at one... Is it tri triple X or double X of, yeah, check them out. They create, they, they sort of create uh, these um, insights into how black artists, including African artists are performing in the, in the NFT space. So you just will see these type of players coming in. They also have this large parcel of land in the metaverse in crypto voxels where they show, um, they show work by black artists. So, a uh, hundred years from now, uh, the blockchain is still existing. That means people are going to put in a alert today that Binance is going to be launching an NFT platform in June. So uh, what are we talking about? Um, I, I, I mean, from, a, from that perspective, you know, I, I'm biased because I'm bullish on the crypto space as a whole, right? I still think that as an asset class is fundamentally undervalued. I think the entire crypto space is worth what about two trillion US dollars, right? And you know, if if we look at Bitcoin, Bitcoin is what like fifty percent of that, maybe a trillion US dollars. 
And if the gold, the market cap of gold is about 10 trillion US dollars, I think that the space can easily 10x, right? So if we're talking about value, and, that, and some of that value will trickle, trickle into the different sectors like DeFi, like NFTs, um, like social tokens, which are starting to pick up, right? I think that, that there's definitely, the space is definitely undervalued. We're gonna see a lot of things happen. I mean, as of today, you know, a crypto punk, the cheapest crypto punk costs more than a Bitcoin now. So the cheapest crypto punk is about $57,000 as of today, right? I believe that, you know, in that five to 10 years, the quality projects that stand the test of time, we're gonna see massive value in these projects. I mean, like, I've, I've been in Discord groups where, you know, the view is that a crypto punk could cost half a million dollars. The cheapest crypto punk could cost half a million dollars in five to 10 years. I mean, it's about scarcity, there's 10,000 of them, right? And I think the better projects, you know, like the Art Blocks projects, like, like you know, the, all the top artists, like, you know, Murat Pak, you know, Trevor Jones, you know, Osinachi, we're gonna see a lot of value accrue to these artists and accrue to the spaces as a, as a whole. I, 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 if I'm, a, I'm not a gambling man, but I'll gamble heavily on that fact. Thank you so much. <laughs> yeah, I think a round of applause to the panel. Um, and thank you to the audience as well for tuning in. Um, and I love the last question. I think it's the right question to end on. Um, and I, I have to say that I, I, I'm also a believer. I believe that, um, you know, it, with disruption, that bubbles will form, but it will stabilize. And, and what we've seen is that digital, we are digitizing as a world globally, we're digitizing. So um, it might not look this way in a hundred years, but there will be a place for digital art and there will be money being, um, tr um, being exchanged for work. So this is really, I think, the, the beginning of the future. It feels like the future um, and we're running to kind of catch up with what's going on with this NFT space, but it is just the tip of the iceberg, I believe, as well. So thank you to you all for joining us um, today at The Points of View and for this conversation. Thank you to all of our speakers as well, the panelists. Um, I think now's a good time to hand over to Oliver, maybe for closing remarks. Well, thank you very, very much, uh, Uinda. Uh, it's been such a brilliant and very insightful panel. So I'll uh, start by asking the audience to give uh, Oinda and the rest of the panel, from Hannah, Ngozi, Osinachi, and of course Michael, a resounding round of applause. I'd also like to say a big thank you to um, our partners, our major partner, Alliance Francais. We've got Charles, the director, right there in the audience. He's been very impactful in the development of this program. There's also Manon here on the first row. She's been here a short while, first time in Nigeria. I say welcome to you. She's been absolutely impactful. And she's only been here a few months, or a few weeks rather, but she's done um, excellently well, very efficient. That's what I want to call her, Miss Efficiency. Round of applause for her. There's also her predecessor, Maurice. I think I saw him earlier on. Maurice, thank you for the great work you've been doing in previous editions. Thank you very much. I'd also like to thank uh, some of our other partners, like Society of Nigerian Artists, that's the body for practicing visual artists in Nigeria, um, CIL Akweko, Five Kauris Art Education, Jackson, Eti, and Edu, represented by Ngozi there, Vanguard Newspapers, Ventures Platform, Business Day, Connect Nigeria, TSA Contemporary Art Magazine, Echo Trends, Enviro News Nigeria, the Lagos Weekender, the Soul Adventurer, Wildflower PR, and of course, Omenka Online. A big thank you to all of them. I'd also like to thank my team, led by Lado Gidon, the front row there, my partner. Thank you, Lado, for your tireless work. There's Emmanuel Wachuku, great uh, photographer. Solomon Oshino used to be with us, but he's also here supporting us, so thank you to him. Um, And I'd also like to thank, uh, of course, uh, all the friends and all the uh, attendees that have always supported us. Uh, my siblings are here, Charles and Neka. Thank you for your support as well. And um, 
I would like to end by thanking, of course, the audience. You've been brilliant. You've been very supportive. Um, I just want you all to know that every last Tuesday of the month, we're going to convene here for yet another very insightful and impactful topic on how art can shape society, move Africa forward, and address all the pertinent issues affecting Africa and the rest of the world. Till next Tuesday, the last Tuesday of next month, you know, I say good evening and good night. The highlight uh, for me is the the disruption that is happening, right, in the industry, and how different players are taking positions to potentially secure um, their interest. And um, for me, I, I think that it's good to look at things from different angles, but ultimately we can't really predict how the market will go. The market will go how it will go. We do our best, we can sit here and make projections, but no one really has um, the finite an answer on the question on what would eventually become the, the norm. We are seeing um, NFTs you know, redefining art, redefining how art is, is marketed, how art is assessed. And we're seeing that the traditional model uh, might not necessarily work the same with the NFT um, arts work. So it, there's a lot of, a lot of um, for me, the highlight is in, in trying to, to prophesy, if you like, trying to look into the crystal ball and say, this is where it's going to end. We're all speculating here, really. Well, I expected um, discussions bordering on um, what I do, which is crypto art or NFT art. And um, the people that were brought on to talk about it really um, went into it because the conversation right now is about a place of NFT art in comparison with um, traditional art. And that is really um, an important question, especially in a country like Nigeria. And that is really what we talked about here. And um, I've learned a lot. I've also talked to people um, from my own knowledge as someone who's been in this space since 2017. I hope that um, what we've done here would encourage other artists from Nigeria to go into the NFT space and of course create some sort of um, positive um, mindset for those who don't believe in crypto art yet. My expectations were very high because the previous points of views have been fantastic. So I knew this, the level is not going to disappoint. So, so I was very eager and very excited to actually be part of this um, exciting topic, you know, and, and futuristic topic. We're very happy with the turnout today. It's the sixth edition of Point of View, which we have uh, in collaboration with Alliance Francais, our major partners, and of course with uh, the Center for Contemporary Art Lagos. Well, today's uh, discussion has been on new digital pathways. I mean, uh, with uh, some of the staggering prices achieved for uh, NFTs today, it's about time we had the same conversation here in Nigeria. We have artists like Osina Chi, you know, who spoke today, and he's recognized as Africa's leading crypto artist. It's very interesting because uh, sometimes people ask, is crypto art really art, or is this just an investment ploy? Uh, the speakers today were very distinguished, you know, in uh, their own uh, areas and their own businesses, all related to the visual arts and uh, they've come to do justice. We had uh, Ngozi Big Bay, we had uh, Shemo Ali, we had Oinda Fakaya, the director of CCA Lagos. We also had uh, Michael Ugu, who is uh, well known on the uh, music circuit. So I think that it's been a very exhilarating uh, discussion and I think that Point of View with the sixth edition continues to fulfill its primary objective of uh, having discussions like this that are uh, interdisciplinary as a way to shape you know, Nigeria and indeed Africa while addressing pertinent issues affecting us and the rest of the world. Thank you.